When people made the leap from hunting and gathering to become farmers, their way of life underwent a significant transformation. Populations grew, settlements sprung up, craft specialization began, and societal structures changed. Much work has been done in the past to understand why and how this transition took place, but there have still been many uncertainties around this rather pivotal point in prehistory. Now, a new study combines DNA with archaeology to work out exactly what the Neolithic expansion was all about. Hunter-gatherers first started to domesticate plants and practice animal husbandry in the Fertile Crescent, a region that covered parts of North Africa, the Near East and Anatolia. Its name comes from its shape and the fertile land surrounding river systems in this region, which were suitable for agriculture and pasture. Research has shown that this took place at several separate geographic locations within the Fertile Crescent at roughly the same time, around 10,000 years ago. This transformation is known as the Neolithic Revolution. Farming then expanded both east and west out of the Fertile Crescent. The western route into Europe was via Anatolia. A lot of work has been done to analyse the speed at which farming spread across Europe, and using radiocarbon dated sites, it's been estimated that it moved westwards at a rate of one kilometre per year. Two routes have been identified, one inland via the Balkans and Central Europe, and one along the northern Mediterranean coast. However, one debate has persisted, and that is just how did agriculture expand across Europe? What was the specific mechanism that drove it? There are two main hypotheses. The first is that it was the result of demic diffusion, where farmers moved into unfarmed areas introducing their practices as well as their genetic ancestry. In this model, a total ancestry turnover is expected. The second is that hunter-gatherers learnt agriculture from groups of farmers and then started to do it themselves. This can be broken down further into horizontal transmission, whereby a people learn how to farm from a different group of peers, and vertical transmission, which is where offspring learn how to farm from their parents. Now, of course, these systems of diffusion do not need to be mutually exclusive, and it's generally accepted that both played a role. However, defining exactly how much each contributed to the Neolithic expansion isn't straightforward. By examining ancient DNA, researchers have made a lot of progress in this area, but it is still limited in that it doesn't indicate behaviour, culture or mechanisms of expansion. Additional analyses have looked at settlements, language, climate conditions and paleo-environmental data to build up a more comprehensive picture. What's important to mention here is that the practice of farming is known to have started in the Fertile Crescent and then to have spread across Europe. It didn't evolve in Europe separately. In fact, the domesticated crops such as barley, various wheats, bitter vetch and flax also travelled westwards. This is quite different to the subject of megalith building, by the way. Arguments have been made in the past that megalithic structures in different parts of Europe, dating to the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, were the result of cultural diffusion. Possible routes for this cultural diffusion have been looked at as well. However, there isn't really a consensus on this. There may have been a connection between the builders of certain sites, such as those who constructed Stonehenge and those who constructed stone circles on Orkney, but this does not mean that every single megalith building culture across Europe and beyond got their idea from the same place. Some sites aren't even firmly dated yet, which makes such patterns of diffusion difficult to analyze. But with farming, it's known that the practice, the techniques, and the crop package itself migrated. In the new study, the research team took an interdisciplinary approach using archaeogenetics, which means that both archaeological and genetic data were combined to explain how farming populations spread across Europe and how they interacted with local hunter-gatherer groups. Three different groups were defined in order to run the model. Cultural farmers with early farmer ancestry, cultural farmers with Western hunter-gatherer ancestry, and cultural hunter-gatherers with Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. 
They analyzed the DNA of 618 European Neolithic individuals from three different time periods. The early Neolithic, so more than 6,500 years ago, the middle Neolithic, so between 6,500 and 5,500 years ago, and the late Neolithic, so less than 5,500 years ago. This enabled them to determine how much migration and how much cultural adoption contributed to the spread of farming. Interestingly, they found that the expansion of farming across Europe was mostly the result of migration and demographic replacement. Cultural transmission played a limited role in the adoption of farming. Hunter-gatherers continued to forage even as farming expanded into their areas. The rate at which they were assimilated into farming communities was low, at around 1 per 1,000 farmers. Mating was also mostly restricted to cultural groups. Only around 3% of between-group mating took place. Previous studies had also shown that gene flow between these groups was minimal, even if they lived side by side for hundreds of years. So essentially, the farmers in time took over, but not entirely. Hunter-gatherers didn't in large part adopt farming or mate with farmers producing offspring that continued these agricultural practices rather than continuing to forage. Now, of course, complex mathematical models have been applied to reach these conclusions. So if the details are interesting to you, then you can take a look at the paper, which is open access and listed in the description below. Past studies indicated that the spread of farming in northern latitudes was slower. The authors of this paper note that this deceleration in the expansion of farming in those regions means a higher retention of hunter-gatherer ancestry. This may have been because the Asian crops did not perform as well in the colder and wetter climate of the northern latitudes. However, no matter whether the northern latitudes, the Mediterranean route or the inland route were looked at, or whether farming spread in an area quickly or slowly, the rate of learning was found to be consistently low. Although cultural transmission played a limited role in the speed at which farming spread across Europe, it was still a factor. However, it's not possible to know if this was voluntary, through force or some other reason. This study is pretty fascinating because how farming spread in Europe is not replicated worldwide. There is a lot of variability in how early farmers replaced hunter-gatherer ancestry in different regions. For example, in Southwest Asia, where agriculture first developed, there's no evidence for ancestry turnover. This suggests that the initial spread of farming across the Fertile Crescent was the result of the exchange of ideas rather than one associated with migration. It's also interesting that although cultural transmission played a minor role, it was still a factor. Modern Europeans have 10 to 15 percent of hunter-gatherer ancestry. So although the spread of agriculture was largely driven by demic diffusion, this did not correlate with ancestry turnover. The authors of the paper point out that their research also suggests that the spread of other cultural phenomena may need to be reanalyzed in order to understand them better. For example, the Bell Beaker culture spread across Europe between 4,800 and 4,000 years ago. On mainland Europe, the Bell Beaker culture had a limited effect on genetic ancestry, but its later expansion into Britain almost totally replaced its gene pool. This latest research shows that a range of cultural transmission rates can prevent a total turnover of ancestry, but be limited enough that demic diffusion is still considered the main driver in the spread of a culture. So even though the Bell Beaker people had a minor impact on ancestry in Europe, this could still be considered as having been a mostly demic diffusion. Similar modelling could be applied to various cultural expansions in the ancient past. That's it. Thank you everybody for watching. Please hit the like button if you didn't already and I'll see you next time.